Welcome to The Big Picture. We have a very big day on the show because yesterday we learned that the most important movie in the world to the movie business is Trolls World Tour. Yes, Trolls World Tour. Amanda Dobbins and I are going to be talking about why it matters so much right now on the show. I'm Sean Fennessy. I'm Amanda Dobbins. And this is The Big Picture, a conversation show about the future of the Academy Awards and the whole damn movie business. Amanda, we got a trundle of news. Boy, we got to talk about the big old fight going down between the AMC movie theater chain, the country's biggest, and Universal Studios. So early Tuesday morning, Amanda, a story appeared in the Wall Street Journal reporting that Trolls World Tour had garnered more than 5 million rentals at a 1999 price point and earned more than $100 million since it was released on VOD on April 10th. This matched the profits of the first Trolls film in just a small month-long period. Universal CEO Jeff Schell was quoted in the story saying, as soon as theaters reopen, we expect to release movies on both formats. That curiously phrased sentence kicked off a firestorm. Now, we will get to every single thing that happened since that story appeared. But just out of curiosity, when you saw this hit, what did you think? How did you feel? What did you make of this story? Did you buy it? Did you think it was a good move? My instant reaction was, here we go. It's time. Everyone's ready to have the fight that everyone has been spoiling for for months, if not years. This is both a really big deal and something that was coming for months and months and months. And obviously, recent events have accelerated all of the situations and also accelerated tempers, it would seem. There is a a putting on a show element to all of this that, quite frankly, I have been in quarantine for a long time and I just like some news. I'm grateful. You know, great. Everyone just make really wild statements in public. Let's go. (laughs) Thank you. I have something to get excited about on a Tuesday. I haven't left my house in over a month. But this is also this had to happen. And this is just the breaking point in a way in a in a long struggle and negotiation between movie theaters and studios. I think in a lot of ways, this is just the kicking off point of a negotiation rather than some world shaking event. This was These were all strategic statements. And in a way, I respect the chutzpah of AMC just coming out. If you don't have a lot of leverage, you use what you have in a big way and you go public. But I I don't think that this will be the world breaking event for movie theaters, but it might be part one in the world breaking event. Yeah, everything that happened after Shell made those comments and that story was published were fascinating. Obviously, as a background to this, we also saw movies like The Hunt and Emma and Invisible Man go direct to VOD after running in, in theaters for maybe a week or two. And then also announced shortly thereafter was that Judd Apatow's new Pete Davidson movie, The King of Staten Island, also a universal release, would still be arriving in mid-June, but coming directly to VOD. This is a significantly different choice than something like Trolls World Tour, where there's a lot of baked in understanding of the IP. But this windowing period, this 90 day period that the theaters and the major studios have agreed upon between when a film can hit theaters and when it can arrive at VOD has been a a political football for the last five or so years in the movie business. And it coincides almost directly with the rise of the mega IP release and also the rise of Netflix. So you're right. This this really is this was the opening shot And a few years after Shell's comments were made public, AMC boss Adam Aaron fired off a fantastically petty letter to Universal Chairman Donna Langley. Uh, This is what Aaron wrote in that letter in part. Quote, going forward, AMC will not license any Universal movies in any of our 1,000 theaters globally on these terms. That also includes the U.S., Europe, and the Middle East. Universal responded, quote, absolutely, we absolutely believe in the theatrical experience and made no statement to the contrary. But as we stated earlier, going forward, we expect to release future films directly to theaters as well as on PVOD when that distribution outlet makes sense. This seemingly coordinated attempt from AMC and NATO to confuse our position and our actions. So NATO, of course, is the North American theater owners uh, lobby and they represent all of the movie theaters, and they have been a a bulwark in this fight for a long time. I suspect that there was a lot of work going on in their offices yesterday, helping coordinate with AMC a significant response. Um, You know, Adam Aaron, who we should say has uh, some experience working in the NBA, a former executive with the Philadelphia 76ers, and is a quite a strident figure in the movie business world. I am so, so fascinated by the decision to go this public this fast. You seem like you almost 
saw it coming. Like this fight was 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 ready to happen. I'm not sure I saw this specific strategy, which is a little bit like going nuclear in public coming. And as I, as I said, I do almost admire it as much as I can admire the actions of any like large corporation, which is not very much because corporations aren't people, even though they employ people, which is important. And we'll come back to that. But to me, it really seems like AMC does not have a lot of options left. And all they really have is they have major financial issues, as I'm sure we'll discuss. And of course, all of their theaters are still closed. And 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 of course, they have their business has been struggling for several years just because of the basic technological changes in how we watch movies. Like the COVID-19 crisis has been very grave for the industry, both the movie industry and theaters. But in a lot of ways, these problems existed in in a smaller fashion before this. And we were we were coming to a point where there would be this showdown over windowing. So I kind of dig that they went all in on the one thing they had left, which is that they have they are the biggest theater distributor in the in the world and the studios still need them for their big movies. And they know that. And so they threw the gauntlet down and they did it in a really sassy way that would get a lot of attention and get everyone talking about it. And I, I, it's risky. I don't know if I would do it, but I am, am not a multimillionaire because I don't take a ton of risks. So we'll see. I do like it again. I think it's pure negotiation. I think that's all it is. And they already both walked back their statements. And I think ultimately there will be some sort of deal that is not exactly what universal wants. And it's very much not what AMC wants, but will be somewhere in the middle of these two things. But I don't know, give me some drama, you know? I'm enjoying the drama. Uh, it's notable that Regal uh, Entertainment, which is owned by Cineworld, followed up this morning, joining hands with AMC on those statements that Adam Aaron shared, uh, stating, we make it clear again that we will not be showing movies that fail to respect the windows. And then a direct quote from Cineworld CEO, Mookie Greidinger, which is just an ext- extraordinary name. He wrote to Comcast chair Brian Roberts, nice words from your team are worthless if we cannot trust you as a partner. So that underlines something really important, which is that there is a a tacit agreement in the the studio and what the studios and the theater chains have together and in many ways it is a a virtuous cycle they really need each other to thrive now who needs each other more is kind of at the heart of this conversation and this issue that they're ha- they've been having for years so on the one hand the movie studios right now make extraordinary profits from big tentpole releases that go into theaters Fast and Furious movies, we saw one get pushed to 2021. That got pushed for a reason. They, they're not putting the Fast and the Furious movie on VOD. Despite all of this fighting, that's not happening. There's The margin of profit is way too high in the theater experience to encourage Comcast to release that movie directly to your home in two weeks, even though you and I and Shea Serrano and all of our friends would love to have a Fast and Furious movie during, during quarantine. We're not going to get that. But it does exacerbate a lot of issues that we see in the industry right now, which is what movies get released into theaters? What is the theatrical experience? And if this only accelerates the question of, well, anything that is mid or small tier just should go directly to VOD, that's kind of a fascinating and potentially frustrating situation. The pettiness is very entertaining. I love this. Um, It's very, it's nice to have a fight, as you say. And there are some mitigating circumstances here. I think the fact that Trolls World Tour is a sequel that had already essentially had a massive marketing budget dedicated to it and that people had been aware of the movie before we went into quarantine. In addition to all the other kids' movies that are going to be released in this format, we saw Warner Brothers was moving Scoob to May 15th. We see Artemis Fowl by Disney is going straight to Disney+. Plus. This stuff is easy to sell. It'll be very interesting to me to see what the King of Staten Island, the Judd Apatow movie, does. Do, what do you think is going to happen there? Like, Will Universal come out with a a proud chest beating statement about how much profit they've earned on this standalone comedy from Judd Apatow and a guy who's on SNL. Yes, I'm sure they will because they are also in the sales business and the, the wall street journal quote that started this all off was about universal trying to spend the decisions that they made and the, in to success. And it is interesting to me that the wall street journal only speaks in terms of the domestic, uh, earnings of both Trolls and Trolls World Tour. I think that's because Trolls World Tour was only released in North America. But Trolls made uh, 300 
million dollars plus worldwide and no one's and trolls world tour is not there yet. So again, everyone is giving the data that they want to give in order to make them seems make themselves seem successful and like they got a handle on the business. And so I'm sure they will do whatever they need to do to make King of Staten Island seem successful. And maybe it will be. I mean, I was thinking about Longshot, which is not a Judd Apatow movie, but is in the similar vein, similar like a comedy for adults that it's not a franchise. It's not for kids, it's not an action set piece. And it made so little money in theaters because so many people just last year at this time were like, well, can I just watch that on demand? So maybe more people will watch King of Staten Island on demand. Maybe our conception of what we watch at home is already changing and the distribution is just catching up to it. It was funny to see in that uh, video that Apatow and Pete Davidson did together. They did just sort of a Zoom conference announcing that this movie would go straight to VOD. Judd Apatow openly said, even if he was saying it in jest, that they were going to not make money on this movie, that this movie was not expected to earn a profit. I find it to be a, a fascinating situation because there's been so little marketing around the King of Staten Island because they haven't released the trailer. You know, this movie is going to be out in less than two months. And the level of awareness on it is pretty low. That being said, they do have SNL, which apparently is going to continue to air to promote this movie on. So there, there are some benefits, but there's some downside. Obviously, people like you and I, 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 I will be devoting an entire episode to Judd Apatow because of this. I mean, it really is water in the desert for us. I'd much rather talk about Apatow and that movie than Scoob. Sure. And I think both King of Staten Island and Trolls World Tour are... Trolls World Tour is very hard for me to say. Trolls World Tour, but they are both benefiting from the novelty of, hey, you can get theater movies in your home now, and it's we're covering them. You and I actually watched both Trolls movies, which I don't think we would have done if not for unusual circumstances. And Trolls definitely benefited from it being a franchise, from kids, from the marketing, but both of them are kind of event movies because of the circumstances in a way that perhaps the 10th or the 20th or the 30th uh, video VOD release might not be. So a couple of other important things to consider here. A lot of the energy has been focused on Universal, but we did mention that Warner Brothers is moving Scoob and something went somewhat unremarked upon last week when John Stanky, who was then the COO of AT&T and now has been elevated to the top job at the company, said Warner Media is, quote, currently rethinking our theatrical model in light of COVID-19. He said, quote, don't expect that's going to be a snapback recovery. That is movie theaters to say. I think that's going to be something that we're going to have to watch the formation of consumer confidence, not just about going back to the movies, just in general about being back out in public. So when that happened, there was obviously a massive panic within the movie distribution side of Warner Brothers. Christopher Nolan, of course, longtime steward of Warner Brothers, and his new movie, Tenet, is supposed to be the movie that reopens theaters on July 17th around the country. And uh, we've heard that he is was not happy about Stanky's comments. And it it underscores that this is not just a fight between theater owners and movie studios. It's a fight between creative people who make movies and business people who distribute movies. And there is this underlying tension around streaming and what streaming can and should do. In the case of Universal, Comcast has its own streaming service that is going to be available to the public at large at some point this summer called the Peacock. At some point, isn't it better to move Trolls World Tour? Maybe it's not now. Maybe it's not next year. Maybe it's not even five years from now. But at some point, to move something like Trolls World Tour, which demands a huge audience directly to its streaming service where it can grow its audience and get more users. That's exactly what Disney Plus did with The Mandalorian. And Disney Plus has tens of millions of subscribers in less than eight months of, of, of life. So I think if you're a theater owner, you've got to be terrified that the, the very state of movies is going to change. Trolls World Tour might just be a TV show on the Peacock in 2024. It like this this all goes back to that that this conversation we've been having for the last 12 months that it's like it it feels like this is over and it's all over but the shouting and we're just getting the shouting now. Yes, 100%. I if if theater owners aren't terrified and haven't been terrified for the past 3 4 5 years then they're not doing their jobs. And to some extent I would argue that they have not been doing their jobs because they have not adapted quickly enough to the fact that the way people watch is watch movies has just changed. It's changed and you can't change that behavior. And that has changed long before COVID-19. So 
yes, at this very entertaining back and forth, which I appreciate for content purposes, is was inevitable. And it's just finally bubbling over. And I think this is the first of many such conversations that we're going to have. And I think things are going to change. Windowing, I'm certain, will change in some way. I don't know how. And I think there will be a lot more negotiating and a lot more rude letters before we find out how. But you're completely right that in five years, Trolls World Tour, God, it's really, really hard for me to say that. Anyway, <laughs> it's just, it's the double R. Anyway, the second Trolls movie. It's like the, it's like the rural juror from 30 Rock. Yeah, it you know, is. The rural it's exactly juror. It is. <laughs> I, and now it's like the most important movie in the history of cinema, and I can't even pronounce it. Great. It's great for my future as a movie podcaster. Anyway, <laughs> Trolls 2, Trolls 3, Trolls 4 will almost certainly go to streaming services. And I, and I think. What you said, you know, Fast 9 is going to be in movie theaters. The big tent poles that are already planned, that they've already spent a huge amount of money on and have organized their businesses around will still be in movie theaters because that's how you make a lot of money. But I, what I worry about is five years down the road where studios decide, okay, well, it's just not worth making those as many of those giant tent poles and we'll just spend less money on Trolls 4 and King of Satin Island 3 and put it directly on demand. And you'll just get a lot more kind of genre confused or not genre confused, but medium confused, like not quite TV, not quite movie things on your streaming platforms for $15, because that's the safest way for these people to make money. I completely agree. That is my great fear is that long-term that's what we're pitching towards. Now, I think that there's two mitigating factors that benefit the studios right now. One is obviously the Nolan types, the people who are going to continue to fight for theatrical release. And that's maybe even generational. There might be 10 years or 15 years of filmmakers who say, you're not putting my movie directly on VOD. You're just not. Now, there's only probably 20 people total that you can say have that kind of leverage in these situations, but they they exist. And then the other thing is, um, I don't know how to delicately describe this. Movie studio executives, media executives are among the most scared people in the universe. And they know that they're being judged on a 24-hour basis. Every decision that they make and the board that that governs the, 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 their opportunity to continue to earn profits in their very cushy jobs, they're, they're, they, they're afraid to make a mistake. And if profits dip for Universal and Comcast because they've decided to move more releases to VOD to be part of, to kick off this revolution, somebody who's in a job now is going to suffer for this long-term transition. And you, I think that the theaters basically need to count on and leverage that fear. And if you're a studio like Sony, for example, where you don't have as much of the market share, where you don't have as many movies that are meaningful to people, you might not be as willing to start trundling stuff into VOD. You might lean more aggressively into theatrical. So what we're going to have now is like, if AMC and Regal is serious about this, and Universal is not going to put, it's not going to have their movies in those theater chains, and they're, they only play it Alamo Draft House or the Landmark or whatever. No, I'm not saying that that's going to happen. But if it were to happen, there are other studios that stand to benefit. And Disney is not going to change its its stance because Disney doesn't release small movies. They only release event movies. And that is part of their strategy is they believe in in the theatrical experience, but only when the movie has a $300 million budget and a $1 billion box office return. So it's there is like a little bit of a window here. What what do you think? You know, I was thinking about last night was the person who decided that 1999 was the right rental price for i think was it was it the hunt and invisible man and yes. and emma and those were the first 3 and they priced it at 1999 and that came a week after you were just mocking me like viciously for saying that i would only spend $30 to rent the Bond movie in my home and that it was going to cost $50 or even $100. And that's gone. No one can charge even $30 for any VOD and home ever again, because now we have the $20 model and no one's going to pay even a dollar more. I mean, maybe they will, but I, I do think as soon as you set that price and start making all this attention about it, then that's locked in. And is $20 for like premium VOD enough to sustain the types of movies or to make them enough money to justify it? I I don't long term, I don't know. Well, so you've you've underlined a very important part of this, which is that 
the Trolls World Tour number in particular was 1999 to rent the movie for a 48 hour period, which was very smart. And what it did is parents showed their kids that movie and then it was over. And then the kids said, I want to watch it again. And I, I had people anecdotally tell me that they rented the movie three weekends in a row. That's $60 to spend for 18 viewings of Trolls World Tour. That's just good business for Universal. Can I just say my thoughts are with the parents of the United <laughs> States always. But in these past three weeks, if you've spent $60 on Trolls 2, God bless you. I support you. I hope that your children have left with the respect for country music as well as rock and pop. Uh, not classical because they didn't feature <laughs> it. That's okay. Maybe play your kids some Beethoven because that movie sure didn't. But anyway, f- the only thing that I would say to that is... That, that's a great point, and that that is very savvy. But wouldn't a lot of those parents just have to had to have rented it anyway, over and over again? Like it, some of this is that the, it doesn't the VOD, especially with kids, cut into the, the home rental and the business that existed to supplement the theater runs of movies like Trolls Two. It's a really good point. This is something that Jason Blum talked about on on the Bill Simmons podcast when he talked about putting The Invisible Man in the Hunt directly to VOD. I think that there are a lot of mitigating circumstances here. Now, typically with Trolls World Tour, they would release the movie to buy at the outset of the VOD window period. So you could buy it for $19.99 on iTunes unless they changed the pricing. And then you'd wait two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and then you could rent it for $6.99 or $4.99. And the rental period would be 48 hours. But if you wanted to own the movie, and watch it in perpetuity, as many parents do over the years. Ask Andy Greenwald, watch co-host, who has been buying movies on iTunes for his kids like Frozen 2 to watch over and over again. And now they don't even really have to do that because those movies go right to Disney+. Plus. So until the peacock exists, they need to rely on this, you know, these intermediaries. And there are all these intermediaries. There's iTunes, there's Amazon, there's Vudu, there's Fandango Now. There's all of these kind of middle middle organizations that are also taking in some profits from the sales of these movies. Long term, this stuff is just going to the the O and O streaming services. That's where it has to live. I don't know if that strategy is going to work well at all for something like King of Staten Island. I'm not going to be renting it three weekends in a row. But to your point about James Bond, Trolls World Tour is not James Bond. And Trolls World Tour is not Fast and the Furious. And If we get to a point, I mean, there's a lot of circumstances here in which this could happen. Let's say there's a second wave of COVID-19 outbreak. God forbid, I really hope that doesn't happen. I hope that people stay safe and are healthy. But if there is a second wave and we realize, man, you know, actually quarantine is going to extend through the end of 2020. A lot of these companies are going to have to make some different decisions about their about their release schedule because it's going to be impossible to produce new movies. And also their bottom line is going to be really important. They're going to get really upset about their stock price when it goes down when they don't have any significant releases. So I do think if you see No Time to Die released directly to VOD, it will be for more than 1999. I, 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 that may not work. It might not be successful. But I do think that they're going to experiment with higher price points. And I think that's true. And I think probably, like I said, I, I would pay $30 if anyone's listening and wants to go ahead and make that possible for me right now. $30 <laughs> in your pocket today. Maybe I would even rent it twice. That would be illegal. Um, let's not send okay, Amanda wait. a pirated copy of No Time to Die <laughs> no. that she pays money for. That would be a way to send Amanda to jail. And the okay. big picture does not want that. That's true. I meant an official release. But anyway, <laughs> but but I do think and I think there will be exceptions in that vein for sure. But for the most part, I think the price has been set at $20. I, for most standard releases, because that's just what's ingrained in people's heads. And as soon as you set the price, people are going to be like, well, I'm not going to pay more than that unless it's something truly exceptional. And if you don't have the theater system and the entire mechanism around marketing movies that you used to have, can you make that m- many movies feel special enough that people want to spend more than $20 for them? There are some movies that are grandfathered in, but I don't know how you how you do that in two or three years. It's funny, we're going to talk a lot about Netflix when we get into the Academy Awards stuff, but I feel like we should address that company briefly. Is there a company having a a better 2020 than Netflix? I don't know if it exists. Um, This is also just a massive net win for them. On the one hand, you could say, well, 
this is drawing more attention to the idea of VOD and original releases getting more attention and less time on Netflix. But it's just one more sign that they just completely upended the entire movie business and their stock price is up. 85 million people at least started Spencer Confidential. I'll never get over that. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Um, and we devoted two full episodes last week to the idea of the Netflix movie and what it means to be a Netflix movie. And you just can't overstate how much they change the landscape of movies. Like what we're talking about here is essentially the financial transactional nature of the movie business. We're not talking about movies that we love. I'd much rather honestly be talking about movies that we love. We don't have a lot of those movies right now. But Netflix just, they changed everything in under 10 years. It's its its just incredible. I don't i don't have a comment beyond that. Just just wow. No, it's true. I mean, it, it is, it's the printing press of movies for sure. And, and, and maybe more generally, I mean, you know, the internet is the printing press, but whatever. Sorry, I've been reading reading Wolf Hall. It's set in that era. I'm really into the printing press. <laughs> okay, Gutenberg. Um, <laughs> any any final thoughts on on this thing that I suspect we will be talking about again in the next week or two weeks because everything is changing here in the world of movies? I, let's just keep having this conversation with the flair and slight rudeness that has been set out in the last 24 hours because we got to keep it interesting somehow. And I, I'm enjoying it. 